Good morning, everyone. Uh, so good to be with you again this morning. Uh, very end of May, May 31st here today. And uh, so thank you for taking the time to join us. I hope that you've enjoyed the prelude music that um, that Jill Hearing has, has put together for us. Uh, it's really been a blessing to have that um, be a part of our service and be available to us again. Just want to pray with you as we begin. Of course, this has been an, uh, yet another interesting week as we continue in uh, quarantine time, especially here in Oregon and particularly in Multnomah County. Um, I just had word this week that Multnomah County is planning on petitioning for phase one of reopening under the Oregon guidelines um, in early June, which would mean uh, that that would take effect about June uh, 15th or so. So we are continuing to look at and monitor that. And uh, you'll see in our announcements as well that uh, our council has met this week um, to, to discuss what might that reopening look like as well. So I uh, just want you to, to be aware that we are looking at that, how to open safely and securely and wisely when that time comes. And we will, of course, uh, be looking to communicate that to everyone as we get closer to it. Let's pray together this morning, and then we'll enter into a time of song and worship after our, our morning announcements. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. Thank you for the beauty of the springtime. Thank you for your protection and your care and your guidance and your presence and this time of perhaps a little slower pace for many people and an opportunity to, to hopefully focus in on you. Lord, we continue to lift up those who have faced struggles and trials and difficulties of many kinds, whether it be economic and the loss of jobs, um, whether it be um, health and well-being, um, either concerns in trying to get medical treatment um, or, um, and make appointments, or, or those who have been affected specifically by the, the COVID-19 virus in, the, in various places or have friends and family and relatives um, who have been affected. Lord, we, we ask for your special touch and your special care and closeness to them. Lord, we thank you for the creativity that you have given and um, the encouragement that continues to go out of, among individuals. Lord, may we stay away from, uh, from negative destruction, temp destructive temptations. May we focus on what honors you and and pleases you and builds up our fellow man around us. Lord, uh, even this week, I think of the fun of, in our neighborhood, uh, teachers driving through the neighborhood in a parade, encouraging uh, the children and letting them know that they are thought of and loved and cared for. May we be the type of people who look for opportunity to build each other up. God, I pray that you would be honored and glorified in this morning's service as we pray to you, as we lift our songs of praise and worship to you, as we focus our hearts and our minds upon you, as we study your word and seek to apply it to our lives. May your spirit guide our thoughts and our motives and, um, and commune with us as we seek to be united in you. Lord, thank you that we share your spirit among one another and that we do not have to lean on ourselves and our emotions and our own understandings in this time, but that we can stand steadfast on the, the, the strength of your word and your character. We trust in you and you alone. We love you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Now we'll shoot over to uh, Wendy Reese on the High Plains for our announcements this morning. Good morning. Welcome to our live Sunday morning worship service. As Oregon begins to reopen, discussions about when houses of worship should open are also taking place. 
At the guidance of our conference superintendent, our church council has begun discussing the strategy and timing for reopening wisely and safely. Our primary focus is not on meeting in our building together, but on honoring God by faithfully living as disciples who are making disciples. Please support Tremont by praying for our leaders and our civil leaders as we navigate the logistics and varying perspectives that affect the decision-making process. Thank you to all of you who have been faithfully supporting the local church financially during this time of distance. Tremont is down a bit in annual giving, but has continued to meet its necessary financial obligations so far. If you would like more information on methods for giving at this time, please contact the church office or check the weekly bulletin. If you are in need of food, you can visit our food pantry on Knight Street. They are open on Mondays at 8.30 a.m. If you would like to support our food pantry, we accept donations of non-perishable foods or bottles and cans. Please contact the church office to arrange a drop-off time. If you would like to be included in our Wednesday night Zoom prayer meetings, please contact Edwin Carbo or the church office to get an invite to the meetings. Check out our online youth lessons on our YouTube channel, Tremont Youth. Those are live on Sundays at 6.30 p.m. or Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. If you would like to receive our weekly bulletin, which has all of our latest updates as well as upcoming sermon information, please email tremontchurch at gmail.com and ask to be put on the bulletin list. Check out our website for the latest videos, announcements, and recommendations at tremontchurch.com or on facebook.com slash tremontchurchpdx. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our time of worship here on this last Sunday of May 2020. I hope you have prepared your hearts and minds and, and soul to worship the Lord. Join us in singing the song, Show Me Your Ways. Show us your ways, Lord. Well, the next song we're going to sing is talking about how we can now approach God and be purified before him. But it is only by his grace, and it's not by anything that we have done, but because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for us. The song is called Only by Grace. <laughs> Your grace we come. 
mark our transgressions who would stand but thanks to your grace we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb Lord if you mark our transgressions who would stand but thanks to your grace we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Only by grace can we enter. Only by grace can we stand. Not by our human endeavor, but by the blood of the Lamb. Into your presence you go. transgressions who would stand but thanks to your grace we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb Lord if you mark our transgressions who would stand but thanks to your grace we are cleansed by God's grace. <laughs> Technical glitches. <laughs> this next song is called This Is Our God. I will worship 
out for all. This is our God. Lifted on high from death to life. Forever our God is glorified. Servant and King. Rescue the world. This is our God.
pardon and peace to all wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctified forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful only Savior, sanctified forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words alive. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful I hope you were able to worship the Lord along with us today. And now we will go back to Pastor Nathan. Welcome back, everyone. Hey, I want to share a couple of uh, quick announcements with you, a few more th little things uh, before we go into our time of study this morning. Uh, one of them is that uh, we are just finishing up the spring quarter of our, our sermon series, uh, our uh, discipleship study series. And so we are moving in. The new books have come and have arrived. So if you would like to get a hold of these, we still have some, or there is also um, available through LifeWay. LifeWay is the publisher. There is an app that you can download um, pretty inexpensively to be able to uh, look at those digitally also. Um, so go ahead and let me know if you've ordered one already. I would be happy to drop it off to you or arrange for you to be able to get a hold of it. Um, or if you are, are wanting to get one, we do have a few extras that I can make available to you. Um, we'll be started with starting with that new series through the Gospels um, next week. In fact, uh, it's broken into three sections through the summer months. And so we'll spend four weeks um, in the Gospels looking as, at Jesus as the healer, then five weeks looking at Jesus the teacher, and then followed by, in August, the last four weeks, um, Jesus, the miracle worker. So we're looking forward to studying our way through the Gospels with that focus. Also wanted to let you know that um, for those of you who have become used to um, um, joining in and participating in the Multnomah Holiness Camp during um, the first week in July, um, and we have typically partnered with them for our VBS in the summer as well. Um, that council did meet earlier this week, and um, that camp meeting is canceled for this year, um, just in combination with all of Portland's regulations and, and suggestions. Um, and most camps are going to be camp canceled for for this year in the in Oregon, um, there are a few children's camps that have petitioned for special allowances and are waiting to hear back. Um, most of them are being asked to do some sort of day camp using social distancing. Anyway, so those are a couple of announcements um, of what's going on currently. Let's go ahead and pray before we um, come back to. Our, our scripture this morning. So let's pray and settle our hearts. Lord, thank you for this day that you have given us. Thank you for this opportunity to gather and commune um, in your spirit around your word. Teach us once again, Lord, from these, these holy words, these things which you have preserved in order to reveal your character to us. God, may we, may we, um, read clearly. May we interpret um, well and consistently um, the truth that is here. May we I, apply it wisely and um, honestly in our lives, that your, um, that your will would, would reign, that your desire of 
transformation would take place in our lives, that we would be more like your son, Jesus Christ, and that we would live in such a way that brings you glory and you honor. We love you, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. Well, this morning, if you want to turn in your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of John, John chapter 4. Um, many of you will be quite familiar with this. This is a very widely um, studied, very widely read uh, portion of the Gospels and an account that is, is most commonly known as the woman at the well or the Samaritan woman at the well. This morning I chose to have some fun and I, I, I chose to call this morning's message uh, Jesus's water cooler conversation. Um, if you can visualize the, the local well as being similar to now somewhat old fashioned, the, the water cooler, the place where people um, gather socially to inter interact for the day and find out the, the news of what's going on, um, as well as receive refreshment and that which is needed. We'll talk a little bit more about the role of the well in a moment. Um, but that, that place where people come together for conversations. And normally in our culture, that's been seen as um, superficial conversations, usually just, just shooting the breeze, just chatting, uh, pleasant, pleasant uh, surface level conversation. Well, J Jesus pulls a Jesus and doesn't really uh, doesn't really go with that same tradition. He he steps outside of the box of cultural norms and really dives into some very meaningful conversation. So we want to take a look at that today. We're going to be in John chapter 4. I'm going to start actually back in verse 1 for some context. And then I think in my notes it says, going through verse 44, actually I think I'm going to stop a couple verses shy of that at the end of verse 42. Let's read. We read here in the book of John, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, Although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the, uh, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, have you nothing to draw? Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that, that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that, that I will give him shall never thirst but the water that will give that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman said, the woman answered and said, 
I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you, uh, this you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our father worshipped in this mountain, and your people and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. At this point, his disciples came, and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why do you speak why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is, n this is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying one to another, no one, uh, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, and they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal, so that the one who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for, that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor." From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to, say, to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word, and they were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Well, we're going to stop there. And uh, in, our, in our study this morning, I want to give you kind of, kind of a heads up of where we're going. Um, we're going to do a little bit of skipping over some of the middle portion, middle verses of this, and we're going to zero in on three key points this morning. Um, one is that Jesus gives the living water that satisfies completely. Then Jesus is the prophet who enables true worship. And then finally, Jesus is the Messiah who brings salvation for all. Um, and that's where we're going to center. But also in light of uh, this week, um, I'm going to back up a little bit. 
in light of this week and some of the events of this week, um, I'm also going to save a little bit of time at the end for a little different uh, focus or application for us. Well, I want to start here. It's not our main point, but uh, in the first few verses here, there's some interesting uh, pieces in, in the context, the setting here, that I just wanted to, to grab really quick. Um, there's some unusual behavior here that we should note. So it's a little difficult to understand exactly what the motive is, but it starts off by saying that Jesus has re re received word back, meaning it has traveled through um, word of mouth and somehow has gotten to his disciples or to him that the Pharisees um, heard that, that Jesus is really gaining in popularity is really what this is trying to say. But it's put in the terms of that he is now baptizing more people than what John the Baptist was. And there's even this note that shows up in, in most translation that says it really it wasn't Jesus doing the actual literal baptizing. It was his disciples doing that as a service, um, as part of his preaching and teaching and his ministry. Um, <clears throat> it, this isn't so much a competition between Jesus and, and John the Baptist. Um, we see that in other passages of how John um, responds when his own disciples bring up that question, hey, what should we do? Jesus is baptizing people. Isn't that kind of your thing? Again, that's a paraphrase. Pardon me. Um, that's not really the focus here, but for whatever reason, and again, in these verses, it's, it's a little unclear exactly what the motive is, but when Jesus receives this information, he decides to move back from the Judea area. We're not told exactly where in this passage, but from Judea back up um, to his, his home territory, the area of Galilee the, um, near his hometown of Nazareth, um, where he spent quite a bit of time. So he's going to head back north. We don't know exactly where in Judea he was. Um, may have been down in the Jerusalem area. Maybe had been further over west uh, in the Judea hillside and countryside. Uh, maybe was all the way over on the west coast. We don't know for certain. But he decides to travel from there back up to, um, to northern Israel, to the Galilee area, which between those two regions, and I should have a map up here, between those two regions uh, is the area of Samaria, which was, um, which was a different country, a different nation, a different group of people, which has quite a bit of history. We're told here in verse 4, says he had to pass through Samaria. I just think this is a very interesting little verse here. <clears throat> There's a lot packed into it. One, that was a big deal. To go through Samaria as a Jewish person was culturally looked down upon and highly, highly avoided. Um, there were roads both to the east of Jerusalem, uh, to the east of Samaria and to the west of Samaria, which good Jewish people, according to cultural tradition, would go to great lengths to travel to one of those two highways in order to stay out of Samaria and not accidentally rub shoulders or <laughs> interact with a Samaritan person who, again, culturally, historically, was were highly despised. And as we go along, um, we'll talk about that that, that um, disunity, that, that, um, that disconnection, that hatred really went both ways and, and had been around for a very long time. So it's interesting to me that it says he had to pass through Samaria. Now, on one level, we can read that as geographically 
He's trying to go from point A in the south to point B in the north. And the straightest, dis, uh, straightest distance is a straight line. <laughs> the quickest distance is a straight line. So that would take him through Samaria. And indeed, maybe that's how we could rightly read this, that it was the most practical way to get there. But again, culturally, we know that most people wouldn't let that stop them, that they would choose to go the longer route for their sense of propriety. I think it's interesting that when we look at this word that in my English translation, this is a New American Standard Bible, is translated as he had to. That word um, is the word for necessary or that something is compulsory, that it um, that it's a pulling, that it's a leading, that it's an ought to. And we can read this rightly as a sense of appointment, a sense of, of need or drawing. It is as if Jesus is looking ahead, and I can't say this 100% for certain, but I think there are some clues here that give us the sense that Jesus is divinely looking to an appointment that has been established, that he knows that there is something necessary to travel to and to, um, to accomplish. And I think that's an, an interesting part of this passage, this sense of appointment. Well, Jesus does go on this journey along with his disciples. He takes them through the Samaritan area and come, if we were to skip all the way down to verse 6, we see that about the sixth hour, which for the Jews would have been um, right about noon, um, that he stops for a rest in the town of Sychar or just outside the town of Sychar. Um, he stops for a rest stop, a break. Uh, to He's weary from the journey. It's just getting to the hot part of the day. And they come along this place that was fairly well known um, and a place where there was the, the local, the regional well, known as the Well of Jacob. Um, it still exists, by the way, to this day and is a well-known spot attributed to Jacob of the Old Testament, believed to be on the plot of ground uh, that was purchased by his father. Um, so he stops in this place, a, a common place, for a rest, and he sends his disciples into town, and he stays there by this well. So you can see kind of this, this setting of the water cooler type scenario. He's resting, he's taking a break, he's looking for refreshment before presumably carrying on with the journey. At least that's probably what his disciples would have thought. Sychar, just as a quick note that's on here, it's interesting to note if, you, if you're if you an Old Testament scholar, if you go back and do some checking, you'll find that this town of Sychar was actually the original capital of Israel when they first moved in um, all the way back uh, under the leadership of Joshua. Um, this was the first place in Israel that they set up as, as their capital city. And now, many years later, that had changed and, of course, was uh, part of the Samar Samaritan region. It's been a long journey, and Jesus is weary. In fact, if we were to start in Jerusalem, um, Jerusalem to Sychar would be upwards of about 42 miles. Now, we don't know for sure if that's where Jesus stopped, um, but this has been quite, quite a journey, quite a walk that he's been on from the Judea area up to here. He's tired. He's resting. The disciples go in, uh, presumably looking for provisions for food. We, we see later um, they come to offer him. They're taking a break. And that's when this story really unfolds. So let's, let's take a look at this. Our first point is that Jesus gives the living water that satisfies completely. And there's going to be this discussion around living water. And I know we're, we're leaving out some bits of the story, but let's, let's focus in on this, what Jesus talks about. In verse 10, let me, let me bring that to your attention one more time. 
we read, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus has a conversation with this woman of Samaria who comes out to the well. Now, there's some some things that are unusual about that. Again, there's a, quite a bit of unusual behavior taking place here. Um, one that Jesus has chosen to go through, through Samaria, um, and that there's a sense of had to about it. Two, that he stops and chooses to stay by himself as, an in, as a man, as a leader, as a rabbi in this area, and send his disciples on uh, ahead or to, to go do something. He has isolated himself. In a sense, he's made himself vulnerable. He's here at a local gathering place, but it's it's not the typical gathering time. Generally speaking, um, water was was um, was retrieved was was uh, brought up um, by most people in the region either early in the morning or late in the evening during the cool of the day when it was easier to go travel, when it was easier to do the physical labor of hauling up water and then hauling it back to to home, most people chose to do that in the cool of the day. And so those became social gathering times, times when people would catch up and, and see friends and family around the well and chat with each other. Uh, I'm not trying to make a big deal out of this, but oftentimes those were the women of the towns and the villages who were doing that work as part of their labor, oftentimes with children in in tow and even helping. Uh, And so it was fun, it was exciting, it was a chatting time of culture. But here we're told this is taking place at noon. And Jesus is... is we perceive him to be by himself alone. And then this, this single individual woman comes out. Why is she coming out in the middle of the day, different than the rest of her community, different than culture? Why is she coming out here by herself? Well, we get some clues in the passage as to what um, her character has been and perhaps how she perceives herself even within her own community her own town. Um, Maybe she isn't someone of good reputation. Maybe she's someone who has been looked down upon by her culture um, because of life circumstances, because of her own choices, and even because of outright sin in her life. And it seems that she chooses to come out in the middle of the day as a way of kind of avoiding everything else. So she too is surprised. She's surprised that someone is there. She's surprised that it's a man. She's surprised that it's a Jewish man. And then she is surprised that this Jewish man opens up conversation and speaks to her. All of these things would have been far, far outside of the cultural sensibilities at the time, what would have been perceived as right. Now, why is that? Well, there was longstanding division and and hatred and bitterness and uh, prejudice between the Jews and the Samaritans. During the times of the great exiles, first um, the first exile being when when the northern kingdom of Israel, during the time of the divided kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel was first invaded. And in the style of that um, invasion by the Assyrians, the Assyrians had a methodology of both taking people away, but also staying in the and in occupying the land and sending uh, settlers or or um, colonists into the land specifically for the purpose of intermarriage. And it was believed that that would help keep the peace longer term if they would intermarry with the people that they were taking over, the the culture and the government, the, the society that they were taking over, that that would help keep the peace longer. Well, that created a sense 
years later and later on of betrayal, of uncleanness, of of, uh, division with those of the southern kingdom of Judah, who became known as Jews through time and through through history, um, they really looked down upon that and, and saw them culturally as traitors. Now, beyond that, more had been done. The, the northern kingdom for a long time, under the division that took place with, with David's sons, uh, sorry, with Solomon's sons, um, there was division spiritually, there was division uh, civilly and governmentally, and so it had been established a separate place of worship in the north um, on a, on a what they called a sacred mountain there in the north. Um, the king had had built a separate house of worship, other th- so that so that his people would not travel down to Jerusalem to the temple in Jerusalem, and along with that, over time came quite a bit of adaptation and and twisting, tainting of the original word and law of God um, to some unique, different interpretations that we don't have time to go all into in detail today. All of this and so much more led to this, this division, this hatred, this, this bias and, and um, dislike, this prejudice against one another. And so for someone who was of the larger, more dominant, uh, prominent group of the Jews, for a man to speak to a woman of a Samaritan just crossed so many cultural boundaries, so many taboos of the day. Uh, Jesus was, was doing something that was would have just been seen as culturally, not just revolutionary, but just absurd, offensive. And the woman calls him on it and says, you know, why are you a Jewish man talking to me? Why would you ask me for a drink? And so there's this whole interesting conversation that is rich culturally with question and with meaning, but is centered around uh, the lightness of getting a drink from a well of water. She wants to focus in on the, the shockingness and his boldness, his brashness of breaking the cultural norms. And Jesus is wanting to focus in on a deeper spiritual meaning and draw a connection to her heart and her mind of understanding. So she asks about, hey, how, how could you even, how could you get a drink? You, you don't have anything. Uh, what do you mean by, by this living water? And if I, if I knew who I was talking to, I could have asked and you would give me living water. How could you possibly give me living water when you don't even have anything to, to dip out of, of the well? How could you possibly get down there? And, um, she ends up with this question of, is Jesus greater than Jacob? Living water. And who is this Jesus? Well, first, living water. Um, most scholars, and, and I tend to agree with this, most scholars that I have read so far, um, when, when we're looking at what is the living water. It's an it's an interesting metaphor, and Jesus uses a variety of metaphors through the gospel, talking about things like like the gospel message, um, and and the kingdom of God and eternal life, and this seems to be encompassing quite a bit of that, and really centered around life in the Spirit of God to be transformed, to be changed, to have eternal life, but to have this relationship, this connection with the Spirit of God, implying all of the character 
transformation that we would attribute to, uh, like in the book of Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit. What does it mean to have the Spirit of God um, indwelling in us, connected with our lives, and transforming our lives, making us like uh, like himself, like the Son of God. And so this is what he is speaking of, and, and she doesn't quite get it. She's asking him, how, how could you even get water? She asked this question, is Jesus greater than Jacob, um, their, their ancestor, um, you know, one of the, the founders, not only of, of faith, um, but of the nation, um, the descendant of Abraham? Is he greater than, than Jacob? And of course, the answer is, if she again, if she understood who this was, who was in front of her, it's a, it's a resounding yes. Yes, he is greater. He is the one that Jacob, um, in, a, in a sense, presumably, he's the one that Jacob wrestled with. He's the one that Jacob um, argued with. He's the one who, who transformed Jacob and his life and his character from being the trickster and the liar to someone of faith, someone um, that he built his, his family upon. Yes, he certainly is greater. And in verse 14, Jesus really gets down to the crux of it. So let's look at verse 14 one more time. It says, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And so this really cements in this eternal life idea of living in the Spirit, being transformed by the Spirit. What is it getting to? It's getting to this long um uh, prophesied this this idea of eternal life, this total life transformation being made right with God in a relationship that begins now and continues forever. Well, this is a, a lot for her to handle, so let's move into our next section. She brings in some interesting language, starting here in uh, about verse 19, and she calls Jesus a prophet. She says, uh, I see, I, I uh, perceive that you are a prophet. This is her depth of understanding, both the Jews and the Samaritans alike, in their connected understanding of Scripture in the Old Testament and the law and the prophets. Both groups were looking forward, were looking ahead to the Messiah or a prophet who would show them the way to, um, to, to a restored sense of community, um, a purified faith and, and connection to God. And so she says, I perceive that you're a prophet. Now, why does she say that she perceives he is a prophet? Well, um, he asks her a question uh, about her husband. She says, I have no husband. And then he explains to her her most private, <laughs> the most private matters of her inner life. And he says, you are correct that you don't have a husband. Indeed, you have had five husbands. Um, we're not told what the circumstances of that are here. And then he says, and the one that who is you are currently with, um, the implication there is that you are dwelling with, that you are living with, that you are having a um, relationship with as a spouse, is not actually your husband. Want us to catch that even in this day, even in a, in societies, both the Jews and the Samaritans, where the law and spiritual things were integrated with civil life and matters. Um, just because they were more that way than we are used to does not mean that there was not sin or that people did not do things outside of the law or outside of the moral and spiritual expectations. There were many people who lived in blatant sin, even in those days. 
And that's what Jesus is drawing out here in a, in a clear but gracious way. She hears these things. She experiences the inner revealing, cutting, probing of the omniscient mind of God. And she responds to that in the best way that she knows how. I perceive that you are a prophet. You are obviously someone who is close to God in such a way that you understand things. Things are revealed. Things are made known to you that could not possibly be made known any other way. Verse 20 and 22 here. Let's take a look at those. It says, she brings up this question of worship. And, okay, what, what side do you land on? What interpretation do you come from? It says, our fathers worshiped here in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to, to worship. So if you're a prophet, that means you're wanting to talk about spiritual things. You're obviously from God. So where do you land on this debate? My, my history, my heritage, what I've grown up with says we're supposed to worship in this way. And my perception of you as a Jewish man is you and your people have always said and argued and say we need to do it with this, this way. If you're a prophet, if you're a godly person, answer this question for me. Seems to be the, the tone in which is coming out here. And Jesus, again, does not dive into the cultural prejudice and argument and, and bitterness that had been present for so long. But rather he goes to a much deeper, much more real, lasting uh, issue. And he says, well, really, <laughs> real worship is on the rise. And Neither, neither you up here in this interpretation and in your sense of how you're supposed to worship, nor the Jews who, and he brings this out, they may be more accurate to the law, the way that he says it is salvation is through the Jews, and he says, you worship what you don't know, meaning you have some false interpretations as part of your tradition, it's been tainted, your, your reference point isn't even accurate. The Jews have an accurate reference point, they still have access to the law and the prophets in a clear way, but even then, the worship that they're doing is one of religiosity. It's one of, of cultural piety. It's one of just being bound to interpretation of the law. It's not what God fully desires as real worship. He says, now a time is coming. In fact, it's right now present in front of you where real worshipers are going to worship God in the way that he's always intended. And he, des he describes that as being in spirit and in truth. Real worship is not bound to geography or just our traditions of what we've been told or what we've grown up with as, as right or a certain interpretation of scripture, but rather is defined by God and his desires and his word alone. And it is, it manifests itself in real spiritual worship, a mysterious interaction of our spirits with the spirit of God on God's terms that are fully engaged in the truth of who God has revealed himself to be, what he has said, what he has commanded. This is the place. This is the setting. This is the foundation of real worship. Where we're not coming to God with false pretenses, with, with our own egos, with our own agendas, but we're worshiping him as our spirit 
connects and communicates and communes with his spirit in the truth of who he is, what he has said, and what he has done. Powerful words that Jesus shares with this woman. And that leads her to a deeper question and a deeper understanding. Now she's moving away or further from just prophet to now she's identifying him with this idea of Messiah. And so our main point here is indeed Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the one who has been prophesied who brings salvation for all. And that's going to be important. Jesus accepts this identification that she, that she um, says as being the Messiah. Let's look at verse 26 here. It says, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Let's back up just a verse or two. Two, one verse, verse 25 says, The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus says, Jesus allows her to say this, and then I, he accepts. He, he connects to this identification as the Messiah. And he says, I am that one. I, you are right. That is who I really am. That's Your perception is correct. At this point, his disciples come back, and we're not going to go into that interaction with his disciples as much today. It's, it's really cool, and it's worth uh, studying. It's just not where our focus is going to be on this particular day. Um, but at that point, uh, the woman, they, uh, the disciples and Jesus start up some conversation. And so the woman perceives that it's time for her to go. And she heads back into town. And there's some interaction between Jesus and the disciples. But let's take a look at what she does when she goes back into town. So verse 28, the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is he? She is beginning to believe. <laughs> the, the, the seeds of faith have been planted. Jesus has revealed himself to her in such a way and enough that it's beginning to, to bear fruit. It's beginning to spring forth in her life. She believes enough that she has moved from seeing him as prophet to now she's really diving into, is this the one that we've been waiting for? Is this the one who's going to change everything to restore what has been broken to, uh, to lead us into eternal life? And so she goes back and she gives her testimony. She speaks to what she has experienced to the town. She says, you got to come meet this guy. I've met someone who told me everything about myself, who knew me inside and out, who, who, who knows everything. Do you, do you guys think this could be the one we've been waiting for? Is this the Messiah? You got to come check this out. You got to come see this. So she goes back with a testimony. And that testimony bore fruit in the early beginning bits of faith in that whole community. So these people come and, and they come and meet Jesus and they talk with Jesus. And it says that they, they ask him to stay with them for a while. And indeed, we're told in verse 40 that Jesus did stay. He chose to stay with them. <laughs> it's not talked about here, but I can only imagine in what ways that challenged the cultural sensibilities of his disciples, um, most of which uh, were, were, were Jewish individuals um, collected from Judea. This had to have been so far outside of anything they would have expected to experience in their lives. It went against everything they would have been taught growing up, uh, presumably, it had to have been so much of a challenge and that's, it's not really talked about a lot here, a little bit in that interaction that we skipped of Jesus and his disciples, but it had to have been a challenge. Jesus stayed with them for a couple of days and, 
in it, we see that there's a transition here at the end of our passage that they go from believing a little bit based on the on the special testimony of this woman who met Jesus, that then they return and tell her, hey, we believe, but not anymore because of just your testimony, but because we've been with Jesus. We've heard him ourselves. We've experienced him ourselves. You know, that is still true today. We are as Believers in Christ have a a privilege of being very much like the woman at the well. We have experienced an interaction with God that is undeniable, where we have begun to put our faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone for the salvation of our sins, and that 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 relationship is growing, and he has exposed the inner parts of us, our secret sins, our inner thoughts, our motives, and he is beginning to work in that in those areas. And we are able to take with us this testimony of transformation of, I may not understand everything. I may not know God completely. I got plenty of faults and plenty of weaknesses, but I got to tell you this story of this one that I have met who has made all the difference and is changing my life. And that God takes that story as the seed, as the beginning of a a kernel of faith for others. But it's got to grow from there. And at some point, whether it be our children or our grandchildren or the coworker or our best friend or that parent that we've been talking to, it's got to move from just their nice feelings about our story and what seems to be good for our lives and working for us and isn't that nice, it has to move from there to them experiencing through faith the interaction of God himself, Jesus Christ, working and molding their lives, that they come to believe because of who he is in the one whom he is. Jesus stayed with them, and later on he moves on from there to other towns. And again, his 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 um, his notoriety, his fame, just increases. Jesus stayed with the Samaritans in Samaria because it was necessary. It was almost as if there was a divine appointment that we're not made privy to and don't get to see. Well, I want to draw kind of a special application to us as we come to a close um, this morning. In light of current affairs um, in our country and in our city, I think it is right to bring this up that even in the day and the time which Jesus was here physically present on this earth in the culture that he chose to come to and the time he chose to come, there were deep divisions and prejudices among, (laughs) among people. And while in Scripture... Jesus never denies that. He doesn't play some sort of fantasy game as if that were not so. He understands the culture. He lives within the culture. And yet at the same time, he, when he addresses people, when he addresses culture, when he goes and experiences it, he does so at a level that soars above that digs deeper than those cultural norms, those hatreds, those bitternesses, those disappointments and breaking of trust in and community of the past. He goes far, far beyond that. Here we see him go past the racial issues, past the um, 
literally the historical hurts and wars and disagreements and spiritual division and and religious division. He goes past all of that to show care and compassion to one that culturally he he shouldn't even be talking to, that everyone around him would say that, that this person is beneath him, is lesser than him, is not worth his time, uh, couldn't possibly understand. This one should be discarded, should be uh, uh, despised. And Jesus not only opens up conversation, but takes deep, meaningful time, and in fact, relays to all of us Uh, subsequent, all of us who have come afterwards, some of the deepest truths in all of scripture come out and are recorded and are made manifest to us during a conversation that culturally speaking, Jesus should have never had. And yet he chooses to give deep, important, life-changing truth to this person who has worth, not because of what they have done, not even because of their quality of life or their piousness of behavior or their um, closeness to God, but because she is a created child of God, because she is a human being whom God loves, he chooses to invest in her. Today, prejudice, anger, uh, racism, um, religious piety, and um, and hatred, uh, political divisions, uh, so many things threaten to divide human beings to place us into camps and to convince us that there is no, there's no bridge, that there is no, um, that there is no hope of unity, that there is no uh, connection between us. And this is just the way it has to be and will always be. And there, there's no way to escape it. May I say to you this morning, that these things are not of God and they have no place in the kingdom of God among God's people. We are not so naive as to not understand that there are divisions culturally that exist, but they ought not be and they ought not find a home or a manifestation in the hearts of God's children the people that have chosen to believe in him. It has no place with us. We are to walk in the sandals. We are to walk in the steps, the likeness of Christ himself. Whether it be here in this account of the woman at the well, or whether it be in the um, the parable story of Jesus speaking of the good Samaritan, again, using religious piety as well as um, racial and cultural division to, to give us a description and an explanation of what is real love like. And love is to be demonstrated towards even a neighbor. And who is a neighbor? It's not the person who lives next door. It's humankind. It is even the one who we would culturally despise or disagree with or not trust. Or whether it even be um, uh, other places in scripture like, uh, like the book of Philemon, which recognizes even things such as, as um, uh, slavery within the culture of the day and yet dives deeper than just the surface level of slavery itself and says, okay, what does it look like for two people who have been impacted by the grace of God to continue living in this culture, not as slave and master, but now as brothers in Christ? 
what does Christian love look like in this broken world that we live in? So I pray for you and I today that we too would dive deeper with God, that we would soar above the the filth and the destruction and the hatred of our day, that we simply would not give a home to that in our lives and that we would choose to live as Jesus, as people who love one another, who seek community with one another, who who offer ourselves, who do good for one another out of pure motives, out of a heart of seeing value in one another because we are God's, cho- we are God's people and we are redeemed by him. Would you pray with me and we'll close? Lord, we love you so much. Thank you for our time together. God, I pray that you would make us salt and light in this world, that we would be testifiers to the goodness, the transformation of your grace, your mercy, your um, gift of eternal life in our lives, that we would not fall into foolish traps of thinking, be coming pressed into the mold and the likeness of this world, which seeks to divide foolishly and to to hate one another and to bring up wars both in physical reality but also in the quiet places of the mind and the soul. Lord, may we walk humbly with you, living justly and loving mercy. We love you so much, Lord, in your name. Amen. Well, thank you all for joining us this morning. We'll go to our closing song now. I pray that you have been encouraged, uplifted, and admonished, and that you would seek to apply God's word to your heart as you continue to walk in faith and obedience. Amen. Let's sing together. Join me in singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. God bless you.